Hello everyone and welcome to this devlog. We have spent a couple of episodes working on creating a very mineral world, but it's time to breathe life into it. Intelligent life. Let's do that in different levels. The first level is simply using my detailed pond system to add a few animals here and there, simply instantiating pre-made game objects. I can also use the forest system to create small herds. I should point out that most of the objects you'll see in this episode, apart from the terrain and a few landmarks, will be coming from various asset packs that I use for prototyping but they will ultimately be replaced. Anyway, we now have a few animals here and there. I'll add some simple animations later on, but this is already something. The second level is creating some particle systems to mimic flock of birds or school of fishes. I could use void behavior for an advanced look, but for now I will just stick to my approach, which is try to keep things as simple as possible. Using the VFX graph, I simply use a bunch of forces to make the particles follow the system. Then I add a bit of turbulence to make the movement more natural. Finally, I add a bit of vertex displacement on the bird's wings or on the fish tails, and voila. For some more advanced VFX graph techniques, feel free to check out my older Magic Library tutorial. The third and final level is to add boats, other than the player, with proper AI. Now when I say proper AI, what I mean is really just a bunch of rules and states that should be just enough for the player to feel like they are facing a kind of sentient being. With the rise of machine learning, I can only assume that this type of approach will slowly disappear in the years to come. Or, or at the very least, it will strongly impact the way we think about game AI. But for now, the old way is just the easiest path for me. First, let's focus on merchant ships. At this point, they are not influencing the gameplay. They are only here to make the level seem more alive. So it's a good way to start because they don't need to be very smart, simply to be able to avoid obstacles and to move from point A to point B. I could have used some kind of pathfinding algorithm, but because I don't actually care how quickly they arrive at their destination, or even if they arrive at all, I went for a simpler approach. Essentially, the AI doesn't know how to reach its destination. It simply knows it's general direction. To get there, it looks at the world, avoids obstacles, always picking the direction that seems to lead to its goal. To make the AI see, I created a radar-like system, which is based on sphere casts. It updates over time in order to spread the cost of all the ships over multiple frames or even seconds. It did take a bit of trial and error to get there, and it's still not perfect, but here are the rules that I use so far. If the ship sees no collider at all, it will simply go in the direction of its goal. If it sees some colliders, it will check whether the two sphere casts that surround the goal direction are obstructed. If none of them are obstructed, it will still go towards the goal direction. If one of them is obstructed, it will follow the direction of the closest unobstructed raycast. And finally, if all raycasts are obstructed, it means that the ship is in a dead end and it turns around. In order to avoid the AI changing its mind constantly, I only refresh the goal direction every few seconds, so it has to commit to a direction for a little bit every time. Finally, the ship modulates its speed based on how many of its sphere casts are obstructed. Those at the front will make it slow down more than those at the side. 
in order to test how good the AI was and how performant it was, I made a simple scene where I can track all of the positions of multiple ships to see their trajectories and I can speed up the time, slow it down or just restart the simulation as many times as I want. In some specific situations, the AI can get stuck on a never-ending loop. Now I could solve this by having it remember dead ends, but as I already explained, I don't need it, so I'll just fix it if it becomes necessary later on. Those are the merchant ships. From these, I made the pirate ships. They act essentially the same as merchant ships when they are in a patrolling state, but when they see the player, they enter a chase state. The chase is defined by simple rules. The pirate tries to get close enough to the target to shoot it. Then it stops moving and starts shooting, with a reload delay between cannonballs. When the player is getting too far, the pirate ship starts chasing them again. The chase may be ended in three ways. Either the player manages to lose the pirate, the player dies, or after a certain amount of time, like 20 seconds, the pirates will give up. When the pirates shoot, they anticipate the future position of the player based on their position and velocity. So in order to avoid the cannonballs, the player has to zigzag around or use some of the elements that I mentioned in the last video, like the supplies or the wind, which can give them a speed boost. This is fairly simple, but I think it works quite nicely for now. I will also probably add uh, other enemies in certain biomes, such as towers or even ocean animals. I also thought it could be quite nice to have huge merchant ships, but they have a hard time moving in these small environments, so I might keep them only as dog ships, or maybe for the open sea outside of the map. Finally, uh, a little gameplay update after a first round of testing. Uh, I'm quite happy with the results, but I do feel like the gameplay is occasionally lacking a bit of interest, especially once the player has figured out their path and their position. So I have implemented a few gameplay ideas that I had, not necessarily to keep them all in the game, but just to see how they influence the gameplay at this stage. First of all, there is now a food stock mechanic on the player's ship. It works exactly like a fuel mechanic, and if it reaches zero, the game is over. The food can be restocked a bit by using these floating supplies, or a lot by going to specific places, but I'm still figuring this out. I think this will make the late game a bit more interesting, and it will keep the players on their toes, even once they figure out the map. The map fragments that I talked about in the last episode now have to be fished out of the water with a precision minigame. A failed attempt will make the spot unusable for a couple of minutes. Finally, ports don't expect a delivery from another port, but rather a type of cargo, which can be food, weapon, medicine or luxury item. That means there's a bit more flexibility when planning route. I'm also trying different things with the map the player gets at the start of the game. I was quite satisfied with an empty map which only shows the ports, but the player was able simply by looking around them and at the map to figure out where they were super quickly without needing any map fragments. So I'm also considering a starting map that is completely empty and the ports have to be discovered through map fragments, just like the landmarks. Now I'm not sure about all of these mechanics, as I just said. There's also a good chance that I will make a simpler version, where maybe you don't have the food stock to worry about, maybe you have the ports at the start of the game, and a more challenging version, uh, which I think can make things a bit more exciting, but can also be annoying if you're just looking for a chill game. With all of these changes, the game feels a bit more diverse in its gameplay, but it's also quite a bit more complicated, I think, to explain. So I'm a bit on the fence about that. I quite like the idea that you could essentially explain the game in one sentence, and then of course you had to figure out the controls and everything, but 
you could mostly understand it. Now it has a bit more depth, so there are more layers to explain. You have to explain how to fish the maps, you have to explain uh, how to figure out position, how to drag the objects. So I'll see how the tests go and feel free to give me your opinion in the comments. That being said, and even if the solo mode is not completely finished, I really want to start working on the multiplayer one. Um, first of all, because it's going to be much more complex than what I already did. And second of all, because I think it might give me a new perspective on the game and it could also influence the way I think of the solo mode. As always, if you like the video, please consider subscribing and see you next time. Bye bye.